So my name is Hrafnildur Arnardóttir uh, and I go by the name of Shoplifter and I think it's only fair that I explain a little bit about that since, you know, I do not um, uh, encourage shoplifting per se, even though this is my nickname. Uh, I moved, uh, well, I, I lived in Iceland until I was 25, so in 94 I came here to study um, Master of Fine Arts in School of Visual Arts. Before that, I was did my ma uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts in the Art School in Iceland. And uh, my name, Hrafnildur Arnadóttir, is just sounds very normal in Icelandic, but uh, when I moved to New York, uh, I kind of had an inkling that it would probably be a little bit difficult for people to learn it. Um, I've always been like really against nicknames or artist names. and um, But only a month after I've been here in New York, um, I, was, I went to an opening and uh, I was uh, being introduced to somebody and I said, hi, my name is Hrafnildur and, and they responded back to me, nice to meet you, shoplifter. <laughs> so it was just a mishearing of my name and being the clown that I tend to be, I thought it was hilarious and uh, in the end I like, started using it as a, hi, my name is Hrafnildur, sounds like shoplifter, but it just didn't even like work. It's just basically a failed experiment in trying not to have a nickname in in the U.S. So I started using it as a um, as an alter ego. It was like became very you know convenient in a way um, because it I, when I came to New York. I kind of wanted to free up a little bit about, you know, like, you know, coming to a new place and renew certain things about myself. I had been thinking about where to go to study after doing my studies in Iceland. And every time I thought about, you know, going to Europe, because we are more kind of like European in Iceland. Every time I envisioned myself in Europe, I saw it in black and white. And every time I envisioned myself in New York, I saw it in color in my head. So um, I, I guess I went with the color and I came here. And that's the start of that. I'm going to just show you a lot of different images. This is uh, from a solo exhibition that I um, had at the Living Art Museum in Iceland. Uh, this was made in 1998. And uh, I basically decided, you know, like I think that when you like travel and you're away from your home, that like, you start thinking about like all these you know, identity has always been, humanity and identity has always been a big part of what I do. And I think that it continues to throughout all these years. And I had just gotten this book. My mom sent me, religiously sends me stuff, you know, like about my family. And here on the bottom, you can see there's a family book, like a family tree. And so there are photographs of the whole family going back to my great, great grandparents. And uh, so what I decided to do is that I decided to just try to make a portrait of each and every one that's blood related to me in that family. And that, that became 340, 340 portraits. And uh, what I did is that I decided that I could only try it once because I was really interested in like, you know, um, not, o like not giving yourself like the freedom to overdo and overthink what you do. And I had to kind of live with my mistakes. So I drew them in these kind of colorful markers that, you know, I could like see here, like I made the ear too far, so I just had to move it. And so I was trying to kind of meet these people and just kind of like try to understand the identity of uh, being from such a small place and the intimacy. And uh, I realized soon when I started doing these things that I got really, um, stuck on the hair, like drawing the hair and the line and started to uh, um, think about, you know, like the way we choose to represent ourselves. And I think that my work has a lot to do with uh, identity and how obsessed we are with creating our own identity through what we wear and, 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 and how we like choose to, you know, tame this, this hair, this, this, uh, um, vegetation that grows on our body and uh, about changing persona and here I made uh, there was an exhibition at the uh, white columns called posers so I decided to uh, um, take myself and like transform myself into this like small town beauty queen with some uh, um, 
like o overdo my look and do something with it that I would I wouldn't want to look like that at all. So and, and make these you know kind of classic portraiture poses. And this was a part of that show as well. These are my legs and uh, um, these are all shoes that I had bought at flea markets, you know, being a kind of a shopaholic, probably, because they're all too small for me and I could never use them. And so I'm documenting myself wearing them enabled so I can enjoy it. And uh, it's about like body image and how obsessed we are with uh, our like body image, body parts, what we're proud of, what we're not proud of, and how we kind of come to terms with who we are through like hiding or revealing, you know, our, our parts. And uh, my hair obsession sh soon started kind of like taking shape. Um, <laughs> when I was about 15, I came across this, uh, uh, I used to work in an antique shop and I came across this uh, flower made of human hair called Victorian memory flowers. It's kind of like known in, in the US and, and Sweden also. And uh, it became very like interesting to me, like, you know, how that becomes an extension of us. And at the same time, as I was like uh, bringing it into my work, you know, I, 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 I would go to this uh, audio conventions with my husband, who is, uh, uh, works in audio. He doesn't have a ponytail though, but I created this, uh, uh, piece called Ponytail Panorama because I realized that you know like we travel in tribes and work sometimes like we the looks are like really uniform within certain work areas and uh, I just found myself in a forest of ponytails <laughs> brushed braided <coughs> elastic craziness and I found <laughs> one that's like the tiniest ponytail I ever found that was on the streets of New York. <laughs> and like when I was at the audio convention, I was kind of like this kind of, because it, it, it had this kind of fetish type of thing because I was kind of sneaking up on them. I didn't want to like, I didn't like ponytails at the time, you know, like on men. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to like have to talk to them about it. So I just kind of would sneak up and like just run around after them and take photos and it became very perverse. I felt like I was like some pervert taking up like women's skirts or something like that. It's puny. <laughs> and then, you know, body parts. So like you can see that, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I like to work with a lot of different mediums. And uh, this is a photograph called Bottom Lines. And uh, it's basically, you know, I was dealing with my complex of having, a, you know, what I thought was a large behind. And I was trying to like enlarge it so it would just stop being my behind and stop become an abstract, abstract work of art. I'm not sure if that was successful though, because it's kind of obviously. <laughs> uh, this is a solo exhibition called Shrine of My Vanity. And this show I did in Iceland in a, gal a gallery called Hlemmur. And um, it was like at the, s at the same time I had been like kind of flirting with fashion and I was like des designing some, you know, clothes, you know, was a way of trying to like I thought like, you know, that might be a good way to try to make money while I was, you know, becoming an artist and, you know, not making that much money off of that. And, um, and I got this uh, award, this is an award uh, um, trophy for excellence in new design. And it was just like I had made four outfits and, and somehow got this uh, award from, so I created these pedestals and I, covered them in this skin color carpet and this is the whole room is colored in skin color carpet and um, and it's called shrine of my vanity and these pedestals were like waiting for more awards it's really like kind of the vanity of thinking that you're great and you must be getting some more award which I of course got <laughs> I kind of have to redo this piece now. And I like to work with photographs also. And this is a photograph I took of uh, two taxidermy polar bears in Paris and uh, the front paws of them. And this is uh, a very sentimental piece. It's a love letter to my husband um, because we um, 
bought, bought some furry moon boots up in the mountains in Poland in Gone Gates. Uh, I've been doing series of performances also. Um, one that I don't have, for example, uh, here is uh, um, where I uh, did, uh, that was kind of like the beginning of the using of hair. It was called the uh, Human Hair Skull Tress. But this one is called uh, Lonely, and it's an attempt at like, you know, this kind of extrovert and introvert uh, situation where I'm, you know, awkwardly positioning myself in an architectural, you know, in a space, in a, in, in, in a, in a building and moving my legs, you know, in, in a, you know, kind of like a synchronized swimming slash home gymnastics slash striptease. But as you can see, there's no audience, so it's a lonely striptease. And uh, here I'm creating the same performance at uh, Luring Augustine Gallery in Chelsea. And that was I'm really bad with news. Maybe with uh, uh, years, 2008. <laughs> and here I'm doing this uh, performance lonely at uh, a sub 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 basement in Harlem. And uh, a part of me is always, you know, you can always only see my my legs. You know, it's like, you know, my pride and joy like the, the best body parts. I'm like, okay, I can deal with this. And uh, the rest is hidden. So it's a way of also being like really exposed and really vulnerable and kind of clumsy at the, at the same time. And so like I'm doing this performance with my legs, but I'm like, I don't have to communicate. I'm totally hidden. So I feel like I'm really introvert while my legs are really extrovert. And in 2003, um, I had a show at ATM Gallery when it was in the East Village. And that's the first time I did um, artwork uh, out of uh, hair. Um, this was made of a synthetic hair, what's in the background. And it was called Left Brain, Right Brain. And um, I started realizing that I was always kind of drawing. So. Um, the hair represent a line to me, and I was kind of like using uh, these braids and uh, placing them on the wall in a way to make a three-dimensional drawing or two-dimensional relief. And uh, imagining that I was able to map the thought patterns, you know, inside of our mind. And um, then I had my own hair braided, uh, um, and I was kind of camouflaged into the into the piece. And here's an image of the right brain. Here, the same uh, um, type of work at the Reykjavik Art Museum. So it's left brain, right brain. It's a close-up. And these are really much inspired by these Victorian memory flowers. And this was in 2004. And uh, then I created these prints that are like some attempt at, you know, creating this mandalas called harmonic hair do. It's like an attempt at the perfect hair day, I guess. And, they, and these uh, um, also became wallpaper. I did a col collaboration uh, um, with Nike uh, together with Ryan McKinley. We created this installation as a part of uh, um, promoting, and that was really interesting, you know, to work in like corporate America suddenly and like try to like marry your artwork. And I was lucky that this was like a very, um, they were liberal, you know, they're not so controlling. But at the same time, you know, like I had to really like, you know, decide on what level I could uh, um, bring my artwork into this, you know, commercial world. And, uh, you know, I tend to kind of do the opposite of what I think is, you know, a good idea, I guess. Or kind of like I want to challenge my preconceptions about what's allowed and what's not. So I flirt a lot with like collaboration and with uh, um, both with, uh, you know, designers and like, like in this instance with this company and 
And uh, I, I really enjoy that, and I don't want to um, limit myself, you know, too much. And, you know, I like to... It's a comment on, you know, um, like high art versus low art and craft and design and fine arts and all of these things, you know, like how, how people obsess about categorizing it and uh, um, what's allowed and what's not to be able to be taken seriously. Um, here's an uh, image from an installation uh, at the Reykjavik Art Museum. And um, this was called Haunted in the Maze of My Mind. This is the hairy hunch. It's inspired by a um, book by an Icelandic author called Otni Eir. Otnin uh, Kripunar, opening of the hunch. So I continue to uh, um, express myself with this material that became kind of like just um, a way of uh, creating drawings and uh, um, dealing with uh, our identity and the, and, and the beastliness of hair and how we are like continuously trying to tame it. We all have to like make some creative decisions when it comes to like dealing with it, whether we like it or not, or whether we think we're creative or not. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, you know, it's like the DNA. So it's like, it represents, you know, like we can all like identify with it in some way. And by making something that's very ornate and baroque and very, you know, kind of like uh, opulent with it, you know, like uh, you make something that kind of like looks, you know, like charming and draws you in. But then when you like, you know, the closer you get to it, you know, the more disgusted you are because this material hair is only like considered beautiful and powerful once it's on the body. Once it's off the body, we are all like pretty much disgusted by it. And, you know, even though I work with it on a daily basis, you know, like I'm still like this in the, in the shower and, and uh, you know. <laughs> At the same time, you know, I was doing these uh, hair pieces. Uh, I was approached by the singer Björk from Iceland and um, she was uh, working on an album called Medulla. And uh, she asked me to create, help her create the persona for her album cover. Uh, she wanted to use hair because the whole album was created only with voices. So it made sense that the, she would be wearing something um, that would be created from the body also. So it was limited by, you know, by that. And uh, um, here you can see these uh, um, Victorian memory flowers that people used to make out of the hair of the deceased person to remember them because this is like the only lasting thing from the body and bones of course you know but maybe that's a little bit more gory to deal with keeping that <laughs> left behind and um, I think that uh, I'm just fascinated with the creativity of like uh, using a material that is you know I mean, I'm kind of like honoring also, you know, the, the foremothers and forefathers of the, my culture in Iceland and in Scandinavian culture and textiles in particular, because, you know, the, that there was such a, there was no access to, you know, um, things, you know, to make, make out of, you know, except from the nature or from the body. And, uh, um, for example, in Greenland, you know, they didn't have any, like, any textile until the th 1930s, they only had seal, only had fish skin and seal to, to cover themselves. And there was no woven fabric until 1930s. And um, this here is made of ho horse hair. And it took me a long time to convince the photographers, Ines uh, von Lamsverde and, and uh, Vinut Matadin, to take a portrait of this pop star without showing her you know, and uh, <laughs> creating basically a still life uh, flowers in a vase, you know, um, on, on her head, but uh, they ended up using it as an inside of one of the covers. And yes, I was gonna also mention, because I think that, you know, just to justify a little bit, this fetish that I kind of have for hair is, uh, when I was about 12 or 13, I still have it. I, um, I I had really long hair and I was, uh, I wanted to go and have a haircut. I wanted to have short hair. 
and she suggested, okay, we do a braid and we cut it off. And, and I was like, yeah, great, you know, because my grandmother had a braid in her drawer that I would always kind of like go and check out. And uh, I was like, yeah, I want my braid. And, uh, but then after I, my hair was cut off, you know, I felt extremely trauma traumatized. And I felt so ugly and I felt so out of place in my body and I just could not, like I had to totally recreate who I was, you know, and I had no idea. I mean, I wanted to have this haircut, but I didn't understand how big a part of my identity it actually was. And uh, it didn't occur to me that it would have such a strong impact on me to lose it. And uh, so I came home and I like, I still have it, you know, like th this braid, you know, put in saran wrap. <laughs> and I found a box with a little bit of a window on top. It's almost like a coffin, you know, <laughs> I, and I still have it. And I wrote on the back of it, the date. And it was like this, it was almost like being de de decapitated or something like that. It was absolutely a very strong, uh, um, Strong feeling, feeling I had about it. And here's the same, the album cover seen from the side. There was a cover of another uh, single uh, called Oceania, which was very nice because it like, kind of looks like a jellyfish. And then I, you know, like got dragged into also like just doing these photo shoots, you know, and uh, um, I created this wall piece and then we attached her to it. So like it was interesting for me suddenly like my work was like performing on a totally different kind of like in a different world than I had anticipated. And uh, being like seen by completely different, you know, people and uh, um, and also being part of like, you know, fashion and pop culture, which, you know, I was inspired by in the beginning vanity and and uh, you know, identity and uh, self-promotion and and uh, and all of these things. So it took a while for me to like also learn to be comfortable with my artwork transforming itself into some other venue and performing there. And here, um, and because I like to collaborate with people and also I like to do performance work, um, I did a performance for the art parade. That was in 2007, it was called Siamese Rapunzels. And I um, chased and found like 15 long-haired women and I um, braided them all together. It was a really hot day and it took forever and they couldn't go to the bathroom for four, ye four, four years, I was gonna say, four <laughs> hours. <laughs> And uh, um, I created costumes for them, and it became like this per very quiet and kind of delicate performance because they had to kind of hold hands, and they kind of like had to tiptoe, and they had to always like make sure they didn't hurt <laughs> each other. And it was this kind of co comical, but it was like so like gentle. Yeah, they would, you know, they would. It was yeah, and I was trying to attempt. Uh, um, to set a Guinness Book of World Records for the longest human hair braid in the world. But uh, it costs a lot of money to get uh, the people from the Guinness Book to <laughs> come over and, and, and have a special legalized um, measuring tape. And Jeffrey Dice was not going to pay for it. <laughs> it was a personal record. Did you take these pictures? Uh, I'm so lucky I have a really good friend who takes a lot of good uh, documentation for me. And some of them I took, some of them, you know, my assistant was taking and then my friend was uh, also on, uh, taking, cam taking photographs. No, I was just kind of like more busy with like just trying to keep them together and worrying about them not being hurt. I'm not really showing you images in time, you know, because I like to see show relationship wise rather than time wise, since I'm already anyway so dislocated when it comes to time. Um, this is uh, from a performance uh, called Knitted Aura, and it was a performance at Gavin Brown Gallery, and uh, it was in 2002, way before yarn bombing, everybody. <laughs> 
and uh, I created this like mystical um, performance called Knitted Aura. Um, this table and uh, chairs and plates and forks and knives is all crochet around by my friend uh, Björk Guðnadóttir. Um, she uh, participated in this performance by lending me this prop, this artwork. And uh, we created these costumes out of like different uh, um, things and we, we made this rotating uh, chandelier with candles in it and um, I created a sheep out of a dog, which I'm very proud of, very lifelike. And so the story, like it was very abstract and it was not like a play. It was almost like a, um, like an imaginary kind of, it, it was playing a little bit with the, the, the mysticism of Icelandic sagas and about this kind of like tourist um, theater that uh, called White Nights in Reykjavik where like I had never seen it, but I just imagined it kind of like a little bit tacky high school type of a theater, you know, but uh, things were kind of homemade. And, um, and there was a seance and they were calling all these different ghosts trying to get to the knitted aura, which is this one here played by myself, of course. And um, they finally read the ghost of the knitted aura. This is from a collaboration that was at the kitchen called Skin, Bone, Hair. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, the composer Nico Muley. And uh, this was in 2008. We were like two years just kind of like bouncing back and forth emails like, you know, this, you know, he, he asked me to do this with him. He was asked to, he was commissioned by the kitchen to create uh, um, music that would be played, you know, as a concert. And he wanted to do it with me and create an experience that would not be theater and not performance art, but be kind of like a atmospheric uh, installation with music. And um, I created a instrument that I called uh, the human hair harp, where I had three long haired women laying down on a platform. And he created, for example, um, a piece uh, that was uh, played by a violin, vi on a viola, I mean, by Nadia Sirota. And um, imitating, uh, um, that he was, and then he mimed, you know, on the on on the hair of the ladies, and uh, there was a percussionist. And I created this web, this stairway to heaven. This was called, and um, the percussionist had like microphone inside the skull, so I was able to, you know, play 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 with the skulls also. And Sam Amidon um, played guitar, but also sang through this uh, um, latex fire. Just, just showing the, the scale, and then we had this hair on the, on the side. And here he is miming on the hair harp. Included in this installation was a sculpture that I had already made called uh, White Wedding. And it was created in the LMCC studio program. Low Manhattan Cultural Council. I highly recommend applying for that. It's a fantastic studio program in Low Manhattan. This is in uh, downtown. Uh, this is in Lower Manhattan. <laughs> so this is basically a cast of a real horse that I prepared the surface of it to look like a statue, like a porcelain statue, and then I added this ornamental, overly ornamental, um, kind of cake-like, wedding cake-like uh, um, creamery, like frosting almost, you know, like a... And I st soon started creating these hair pieces uh, in the shape of planets, uh, comets or uh, stars. And, um, and when I looked up the, the word comet, I found out that in Greek, uh, it, uh, it's a word that comes from Greek and it means long-haired and uh, long-haired star, basically. 
here's another one like um, this big at the Luring Augustine Gallery. And so the work started finding itself. I started being asked to like design these, you know, I have been designing costumes for Björk and then I have a designer friend here in New York, uh, Victoria Bartlett, who has a label called VPL and she wanted to have these kind of grand uh, finale pieces for her um, fashion uh, shows at the uh, New York Fashion Week. So together with Etta Guðmann's daughter of Hello Icelander, we started creating these kind of finale pieces for those uh, fashion shows. And it was a way of like kind of, it was kind of interesting for me to like create these sculptural pieces that look so much to, like my work, but like to have them be wearable but still to be like, they're not logical as, as clothing. Well, they are to some people maybe. And they started looking like armor. And uh, um, so I saw the artwork suddenly performing in a platform that was not the art world, but the fashion world. This one was actually worn by Lady Kaka. There was like few people that would <laughs> put this on. <laughs> and then of course you would have her designer just copy it in black for herself. <laughs> but I like working, you know, I like flirting with these other like disciplines and just kind of like not denying myself to work, you know, because I'm such a, you know, it, ins it informs, you know, like the, the, my own practice in the studio and it kind of like opens up and like kind of, it's fun, you know, like, because I like to be introvert in the studio, but I'm really extrovert too. So, you know, it's really nice, you know, to kind of break out of the boundaries of being just, you know, like, yeah, I'm just going to be a fine artist and, and, you know, allow yourself to to use opportunities that inspire you. So like if, if, if it's something that I feel like I want to do, then, then I'm not going to deny myself of it. This is called Vanity Beast from Hell. And it's a, uh, um, so you see this, this thing around is the same thing as this. Well, it's two different, thi uh, two different capes, but uh, um, used in two places. This is from a show that I did in uh, a trolley gallery in London in 2009. Um, this piece is called When Night Falls and it's like a doorway or like a, like a, into another dark place. And uh, here I work also with uh, human hair the cape is also from made from human hair, and these are all all the hair that I use is human hair, ex uh, uh, human or synthetic hair extensions that are sold to hair salons, to be used in that for that purpose. I like to work with mass-produced materials that already you know exist in the world, and transform them into like uh, something else. And uh, these are this is a series of work that is called Vanity Disorder. This is Vanity Disorder in I-8 Gallery in Iceland in 2009. There's a close-up of it. And it becomes very much like uh, graffiti or like drip paint, dripping paint. It's, you know, like, it's a, it, for me, it's a drawing. It's a, it's a geometric drawing or like, yeah to create this illusion and sometimes it comes out, it, co uh, it is not flat on the wall only, it also like goes between the walls and the corners. So it has a lot to do with, uh, um, you know, I graduated from the painting department in Iceland, but I found very quickly that I th was not satisfied with painting two dimensionally. And, and uh, I mean like, you know, yeah, it's like the painting is sometimes comes into the work again, which is interesting because I don't think it's in the foreground, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot in the background. And this is the um, piece called Burn. It was in the window of Trolley Gallery in New York. And here I am like using black. As you can't really see it very well in this photograph. It's black, orange, and red. So it looks very much like uh, lava. It looks more like this. 
so it's like going back to my roots and like really just trying to uh, um, you know try attempting to you know dare to use the cliche that is Icelandic volcano and lava and here I am at the Liverpool Biennial in 2010 and in the windows there is uh, um, it's uh, um, photographs of a bonfire that I had and uh, they are printed onto transparencies and then cut into collages and they are like loose from the window and they move so to create this uh, burning um, effect and like one of these things that happen to you when you're doing installation work is like you get this uh, you know space and then when you arrive then you just put it on the wall you realize you got a black cross in the middle like I was like not I didn't intend to be showing burning black crosses <laughs> um, I was like I hope my dad doesn't see it he's a priest and uh, no, no, but it's like, you know, it's one of these things. And also like, you know, this space had been allotted to me. And then, you know, like I put this fire piece there and then it just happens that the fire extinguisher is just right there in the middle of the room. And so that, you know, like starts to play a part in the piece. And, you know, you kind of have to respond to this and make decisions of like how you're going to like react to that. And, and, you know, in this case, you know, the fire extinguisher was basically not, you couldn't reach it. And here's an installation, uh, a street view from an installation I did in collaboration with uh, um, Eli Sudbrak and Christoph Hamaite Persson uh, from the art collective uh, Assume Vivid Astrofocus, AVAF. And uh, we were commissioned to make this uh, window piece. Uh, they were starting to use this window for artwork. And uh, we were very happy to be asked to do this. So they created these neon lights, these blinking neon lights, and I got uh, free reign to do whatever I wanted uh, to go with it, you know, and kind of like interact with the neons. And it was great. They, 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 it was supposed to be up for six months, but it was up for a year and a half. I don't think you mentioned the Desert Moment. Yeah, oh, I didn't mention that. <laughs> this is at Museum of Modern Art in New York. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was, uh, uh, it was great to be able to put up a piece in this place, of course, you know, and it's like a major kind of like, yeah, fantastic, you know. And, uh, but one of the beauties about it was that just a lot of people that were not on their way to MoMA, they were just on their way to work, you know, whatever, like, got to enjoy it and I have a video later that I'm going to you know, play for you from that shows this piece much better um, and it just brought tremendous joy to people you know and I I am still meeting people that is kind of like it, because for me it was a way of like showing this kind of like explosive color almost like explosive rainbow that would fill up you know like your whole visual you know space and uh, almost like this color therapy like that we have, like, you know, or light therapy we have to do in Iceland because of like depression and all of that. And, uh, um, but it worked. It totally like uh, um, created some sort of like optimism and uh, um, people kind of like said they w walked away lighter, with lighter steps, which was wonderful. And after that I started creating these like uh, more abstract kind of like uh, um, painterly type of work uh, called study for an opera with these screaming colors that just kind of like flow and kind of scream at you wanting to be an operatic colorful operatic something and these are done by like braid like you know it took me a while to come from the brown human hair look you know that uh, I was uh, trying to comment on like the humanity you know and bring color into my work and use this like Halloween clown colors that is like you know the cheap kind that I thought I was a taboo I wasn't gonna like test that but then you know like it just slowly kind of was brought into the 
work. And then, you know, like I use a lot of the leftovers and this, has, this is some like yarn that has fallen down to the ground and uh, it's, a, it's a photographic piece, it's called Stardust. So I feel like, you know, a lot of the work, you know, has to do with the microcosmos and the macrocosmos, you know, like the, like a lot of, you know, like the, we have so much landscape inside our body that we have no clue what, the, what it looks like. And then we have all this like images from, you know, space and you see the images from the space and, and from the body and they're like absolutely the same thing. And uh, my work was starting to be very two-dimensional and I had an urge to like use more materials and you know like together with the hair so I started making them three-dimensional and it started with this piece called My Sister and Her Sock and it's an ode to my sister who was uh, visiting me in New York and tended to kind of forget one of her socks in my house and I missed her very much and I never like knew like what to do with this sock should I send it to her should I wait until she got back to New York and maybe had brought the other sock, you know, or... But it's made of uh, plaster, the sock, so it's just basically a sculpture about her. She doesn't have pink hair, though. And I started making these characters and it became this kind of like... Almost like these hat stands. I started making, you know, like these hats for Björk for her tour. And I wanted to be able to use them as sculptures also, some of them that I made that I didn't, you know, like didn't go to her and so I created these hat stands and they soon became this body of work called Imaginary Friends because they started to be turn into these characters. And using a lot of material that I've accumulated, like I'm a hoarder. I'm, hi, my name is Hapnder Avnder, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> um, so I was able to like, you know, kind of incorporate a lot of these uh, things that I could not I uh, rid myself off like these old stockings that I had since I was like 16 and was never going to use but just had to have them and, and I really enjoy like being able to put them together and you know use them in my work. Black Magic Woman is the name of this one. And that's just a combination, it's human hair, it's rope. It's uh, trimmings, it's plastic, it's uh, human hair, it's a do-rag. And these are like uh, um, scrunchies made into sport socks. Um, because when I buy the synthetic hair extensions, you know, these uh, scrunchies get left over. This one is called Bomba and it's basically about PMS. A lot of you will know what I talk about. <laughs> And here's an imaginary friend called um, a bearded loner about to bend over. <laughs> yeah. And this is little titty. This is this is a, like a single sock with uh, pink hair inside. And then I like use this technique where I kind of like pluck it through. Uh, and here we are at the um, installation that's made, it was in Sweden, in a place called uh, the, the Boros Textile Museum. It was in, uh, it was in a relationship with, uh, uh, with an award that they give every year to, or every other year, to uh, a, text, a Nordic textile artist. And it was very interesting for me because I never really saw myself as a textile artist in particular. But uh, a lot of my work uh, is made of fiber, so it uh, falls into that category. And um, these are scrunchies and there are found objects in here. These are placemats and here's a um, glove. Here's a glass. This is like a... It's like a what are these accumulated things? And these scrunchies are like, I started making these, you know, they, they are leftovers from when I buy the synthetic hair, so they are like always in the, at the end, and I just couldn't throw them away. So I started like creating this, and then, you know, I wanted to make this big um, 
peace that would run in run run around in this house you know just like any kind of inner uh, inner kind of nerve system or or, 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 or or tubular you know because the buildings they are also like bodies you know you have all these like air and water and, and things you know like just kind of traveling around in it and uh, they're called emotional spines these kind of work and this was in 2011 And I, I made this uh, lonely performance, but I, and this here I started making these costumes for myself out of hair. So I was changing myself into like this kind of planetary person. I was like hidden inside of it. It looked like one of the sculptures in the beginning, and then I w moved around um, and uh, created a performance. In the background, you can see a pink smiley that's made out of synthetic hair. And here's a burning and it and here's a series of these kind of more flat like um, comets I think this is called Death Star Hippie Planet. There's a poster for that I made for an exhibition. We have made contact. What's the name of that? And these are more like cells, they like more like blood cells, they like this is like a more of a nodding kind of technique. And this is a self-portrait as a star, as you can see. <laughs> so you can see, like, I just kind of, like, it's been, like, funny how I started off, like, trying not to be limited by one medium, and this kind of medium kind of just fell into my lap. And I just continued to um, investigate it its roadways, sometimes mixing it up with other, other materials and sometimes not. Here's a perf performance, Lonely, I did at, oh, what's the name of the gallery? Yeah, s I can't remember the gallery, sorry. <laughs> And the last few images I'm going to show you is from an installation I did at uh, the Clock Tower Gallery that just opened up its last exhibition after being and running in for, for like 40 years or th 30 or 40 years, I think. And um, uh, the founder of that space, Alana Heiss, who also founded PS1, uh, invited me to create uh, an installation out of synthetic hair in the clock tower at the top floor of the building. And uh, I created this landscape or kind of like um, cave-like situation. And uh, I worked with a musician called uh, Kriya Brekkan from Iceland, who created simultaneously at the opening, uh, she had a performance for the whole period of the opening, um, with a mic and like creating a soundscape to this piece called Nervescape. So she was like an organism kind of floating around, you know, like here you can see her butt sticking out and feet, you know, like she's kind of traveling and climbing and going in and out. And she was like a, and here you can see the uh, volume of it. There was a, this metal structure in the, in the, in the clock tower that, um, before they would uh, take it down, they wanted to, uh, to invite an artist to interact with it. And it was a perfect uh, um, foundation for creating such a, you know, a large scale artwork. And it kind of like came over you, it was almost like stalagmites and stalactites. And here's the... Here's the video from MoMA that uh, I promised to show you.
just so you can get a little bit of an idea about you know the piece in action. It looks a lot of like wool also. It's very inspired by like Scandinavian tapestry too. Thank you. That was it. <laughs> if you would like to ask some questions, I can answer them, maybe. I think that fashion, you know, can potentially cross over to you know, be very artistic. And I think that, uh, you know, you know, I myself, you know, like carry with me this tradition of like wanting to separate things, but I like to kind of like explore these gray areas and try to like uh, um, allow myself to work in these two worlds because I think that they are two worlds. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of creative medium that can be art but uh, my work exists in the art world as artwork and when I make an outfit that performs in the fashion world then it becomes fashion but if I use it as a costume in my performance it's again artwork does that make sense yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's what you want to call it I think that uh, um, when I, s you know, s went from like this finer human hair looking synthetic hair um, over to using color and using this more cheap kind of clown hair, um, it uh, wasn't necessarily like, you know, vanity wasn't necessarily, you know, in the foreground of the work as much as, and, and, and the, hu you know, identity wasn't, human identity wasn't maybe at the core of the of the piece but it started to become just a material that I became very um, comfortable with using it and expressing different uh, you know ideas about fiber being you know just you know like a thread being like a line like a drawing so I think that's uh, um, it, 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 it wasn't meant to be a, a reference to human hair endlessly it became it just a medium to use to express different things. A lot of it, you know, like, you know, you, you go about, you know, you're, you're just living in the city and you are like, uh, um, you meet a lot of different people and, you know, they, they see your work 
they think about you in a context of, you know, for example, you know, with Nico Muley, you know, I, you know, he's not a visual artist, but he makes music and he found this text about, you know, like two sisters walking down a stream and one throws the other one in the river and uh, she dies and goes down the river and, and uh, a man picks her up and, and uh, makes a violin out of her bones and uh, the string for the bow out of hair. And he wants to do a music about that and he wants to like not only do the music but have some sort of like a stage uh, thing with it. So like uh, he, because of my medium I guess and because of like, it, it, it has a lot to do with you know like meeting people and like friendships and uh, you know and communicating you know your like life philosophy and like your viewpoints on your own art, art, art product and uh, or artwork and um, meeting of minds and just you know being comfortable uh, with uh, the, the the conceptual level that you are on together with this person and trust there's, there's a lot of trust I mean I think it starts a lot for me with just friendships and um, with people kind of like reading you know I read into their stuff and they read into my stuff and somehow um, it's a back and forth and before you know it there's like a new byproduct of these two minds happening or three minds so a lot of the collaboration co come about uh, um, I, I have been I've been contacted to do projects with strangers and um, the outcome just you know, I did, I did once for like a magazine and I just I didn't understand the outcome really. Like I, it, this became this kind of like, it, it wasn't like a full collaboration. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, you did this Björk album and now we want to do the hair for this, with this photographer. And, but it wasn't, uh, there was no time spent, you know, like um, marinating your minds together. So I think it starts a lot with, you know, a trust for like a certain trust and taste for certain people's aesthetics. My, yeah, like I, I, I really enjoy the process, you know, in the beginning of my art career, it was like painful to deal with text, you know, and deal with naming them. I just wanted them all to be called untitled because I felt really uncomfortable uh, with text. And um, I like using like song, you know, references, you know, for, to just, f you know, feel fat and adds another layer of like pop culture also to the piece. But uh, more of them have um, not so, like a, a lot of them have like long titles, like the European touch of the ghost theater presents the knitted aura or haunted in the maze of my mind. I like to over dramatize it sometimes. And like the skull that you saw is called Sleeping Beauty. Um, when I choose titles for, for exhibitions or for work, you know, I sometimes uh, I have this like, you know, I can't, you know, like uh, I have to look at words and uh, I have this, you know, old uh, dictionary from Iceland, Icelandic English dictionary. And I just kind of like go through it until I feel like I, I not like till I feel it's not a Ouija board thing. Uh, till I like, you know, find a word and then I find, you know, like other words, thesaurus. How do you pronounce it? I don't know. Thesaurus. Dinosaurs. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And you know, like for example, comet. I was like, okay, should I call it planet or should I call it, you know, la la? So I like planet. Oh, comet. Oh, what's comet? Oh, la la. And then I'm like, okay, of course this piece has to be called comet because it's the long-haired one. I don't know. It's just uh, I really enjoy like searching for for words to go with the the work. Now I do. I didn't before. Yeah, certainly, you know, a Victorian kind of like, uh, um, like pompous, you know, white, you know, just crazy what people have been like doing with their hair for centuries. 
But the most, uh, the latest uh, um, fascination I have is uh, through an article about uh, the fact that during the Vietnam War they uh, um, recruited uh, um, what they now called First Nation, I believe, more than uh, um, uh, American Indians, right? Native Americans. I'm trying to be politically correct to the core here. Um, they were recruiting the First Nation people to to come and uh, uh, work in the army in, during the Vietnam War, because they were exceptional. They were like certain people from these you know tribes that were exceptional trackers, and they could sense danger coming from like way before anybody else, um, with almost like a sixth sense kind of ability, like almost you know, supernatural ability to kind of, you know, like, sense the enemy. So they were recruiting them f to, to, the, to the army. And, um, and then, you know, they go to the army and they have a crew cut and, uh, um, and then they fail at all their tasks because they lose, completely lose their, you know, supernatural abilities to track the enemy. And there was a research done by a psychologist, you know, during that time, you know, they were researching into this. This was in the, what, 60s. And um, what they found is that, uh, um, that they had developed some sort of like sixth sense, you know, like through their hair, that it was actually like working very much like an antenna or whiskers. Mm -hmm. And the fur um, made them like, you know, they were like, it's also with the elements, with the wind or with, you know, I don't know, like, and I'm just fascinated by the fact that they ended up like giving these special trackers uh, the exemption of having a crew cut because they hired them for their ability and if they would cut their hair off they would lose their talent basically so in my you know I've been working with hair imagining it being this nerve system that kind of grows off our body and you can read into it all these like interior you know um, ideas and things and uh, it's just fascinating to me that that you know there's something to it and then also like you say you know from the romance and then you know like Samson and Delilah no yeah like that she ended up cutting off her hair and he lost all his power so there's all these myths you know to the like the power of the, the, you know like that well we we think that it can't be like there's like a lot of like you know this you know it's, it's a pride and joy to have long hair it makes you more sexy it's in the movies you know you know when they're gonna make love the woman takes out the thing and you know whatever and and it's all like super sexy and uh, um, and so there is yeah we all seem to agree with that there's a certain like you know strength you know we're all it's it's, it's you know like and it's it's a lot of trauma too you know for example to lose the hair you know during the Holocaust, you know, they would uh, cut people's hair off, you know, it's in order to like break down their spirit and they would collect the hair and use it for stuffing for pillows for themselves, I don't know, like even. But uh, when I, you know, because my husband is from Poland and when I talked about my work in Poland, you know, suddenly I get this whole other like sensibility, re re uh, like that people read into it, you know, because of the Holocaust and that it was a matter of like, um, taking away you know what what made you special what made you you and and uh, it helped to break down your spirit so I don't know I'm just I could go on and on you know about this <laughs>
Yeah, and about communicating, you know, like it is, it, you know, it, it, it's about communicating, you know, like, uh, um, you know, like slowly, like you start building on to your own self, you know, like own artistic philosophy. And uh, for me, it very much became like a, just a way of life. I don't know, like it's a, it kind of like, you know, it melts into everything I do now, like, and very quickly started doing that. So just a matter of like not editing yourself too much before you do something, just like at least try it. And then you can abandon it, but at least you, you made it happen. And then you can decide, you know, if that's what you want to do or not. So just like do as much as you can with the time. And this is such a blessing to be in a school because it's like a, pri it's, it's a, it's a privilege because like I was saying today is like, uh, here's where you can, it's the most comfortable place to make mistakes and, you know, and get a lot of people to like, you know, help you through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say one thing also, which is something that I found recently, is like the latest brain scans. These are the latest scans of the brain. Isn't that cool? <laughs> when I saw this, I was like, hell yeah, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> They have to like, you know, do these images with uh, um, uh, putting some color just to kind of identify the different nerve s systems that go through the body, I guess, or go through the brain. But no, I did not color that personally in that person, <laughs> although I wish I had, you know, I would have been there just like. I don't know if you're ready for like a tiny bit of a video from the clock tower like you suggested. Uh, it's a short excerpt from a, um, Actually, it's not from the clock tower. It is from the same uh, installation in uh, um, Sweden. This is uh, Kriya Brakan uh, um, performing in the Nervescape as an organism, creating the music simultaneously. I'd like to add that this was taken on my iPhone with a lot of coughing Swedish people. <laughs> Everybody was taken off of Sweden. And I think that's it then. Thank you. Thanks for having me.